need His help to know that He is near us because there's so many things that entangle us. There are so many things that, that want to weigh us down that sometimes we lose sight of Jesus. And so um, crying out to Him in song like that can be a, a way for us to just come to the place where we say, okay, God, speak to me. Speak to me through Your Word. And so that, that's where we are here this morning. We've all lived in that goodness of God and, and we're living in the goodness of God right now. And so I trust that those songs have ministered to you this morning. So as we begin our study in the book of Hebrews, I want to ask you some simple questions. If your car starts once every three tries, is it reliable? If you only go to work once or twice a month, are you a loyal employee? And would you still have that job at the end of it? If your refrigerator stops working for a day or two every now and then, do you say, oh, well, it works most of the time? If your water heater provides an icy cold shower every now and then, is it dependable? If you miss a couple mortgage payments every year, does the bank say, 10 out of 12 is a bad, you're good? If you're only faithful to God when things are going well, are you a faithful Christian? See, do you apply the same standards of faithfulness to yourself that you expect from other areas of life? We expect faithfulness and reliability from things and other people. Should God not expect the same level of faithfulness from us? With those thoughts in mind, please turn to Hebrews chapter 1. We're we'll going to be looking at the first four verses of Hebrews, and we're starting this marathon trek. I hope you, you, you've strapped in, because this is going to be a long journey. Right? It's, it's going to take us through the summer, it's going to take us into uh, the fall a little bit, but it's a marathon journey through this book that is a marvelous book. There's great theological truth in this book, and there's very practical truth. And some of the, the truth that, that we're going to find here this morning and even as we go through this book, there's going to be some truth that's going to blow our minds. You see, within Scripture, there are some tensions. There are tensions of things that we try to wrap our head around and we can't fully explain them. But we accept them by faith because God says it in His Word. And there are going to be some of those things that we're going to come across in Hebrews that are going to be hard for us to fully comprehend. But there's also going to be some things that are very practical. Because Hebrews is really a practical book about faith. Specifically regarding the faithfulness of God's people. We're going to explain that in, here in just a little bit. So let me set the stage for our journey through the book of Hebrews. Well, let's deal first with the authorship. And I'm going to come right out of the bat. I'm going to say the author is the Holy Spirit. Thank you. Because you see, there is no clear author identified in this book. We have no idea who really wrote the book. Many people have offered various names as to the person who wrote this book, but really, Origen said it best. But as to who actually wrote the epistle, God knows the truth of the matter. That's it. We don't know the specific writer. The only information we gather from the book of Hebrews is that he had a relationship with them. Uh, he knew of their history. He knew of their love for other Christians. He knew of their spiritual condition, and he's going to address it. He expressed a desire to visit them with Timothy, and he requested prayers. Whoever this writer was, we also know that he had a preference for the Old Testament and the Greek translation. Greek was the common language of the day, and the writer of Hebrews is a master of the Greek language. And that would have been the translation that was most uh, familiar to his readers. Uh, because when they went away into captivity, uh, remember we talked about that in our study of Habakkuk, they began to lose the Hebrew language. And when Alexander comes on the scene, when they're returning back you know, through the Medes and the Persians, and then while they're reestablishing, Alexander comes on the scene and he makes Greek the common language. And so many of them had lost Hebrew. And so when he's writing to them, he's reading and writing and quoting from the Greek translation of the Old Testament. 
And so the best answer that we have for who wrote the book is the Holy Spirit. Okay? So, so we'll leave it at that. When was this book written? Somewhere between 67 and 69 A.D. It was quoted by Clement of Rome in A.D. 95, so we know it was before that date. But there was a very significant event in the life of Israel that happened in A.D. 70. In A.D. 70, the temple was destroyed. So before that point, the Jews were still practicing their sacrificial system, and they were going to the temple to do that. But in the conquering of the temple they had to have that eliminated. And so what you see here in the writing of Hebrews is the writer uses the present tense. When he's talking about the the practices of the Jews, he's writing in the present tense, indicating that those were still going on. Because what he's going to do is he's going to tell us that Jesus is better than those things that you're presently doing. And had that event already occurred, it would have really played into his argument as to why you need to get rid of those Old Testament sacrifices. Because the temple's not there, you don't need to go do those anymore, but it wasn't. So that's why we kind of understand the writing is between 67 and 69 A.D. Right? The original audience, who was he writing to? Primarily Jewish believers. And, and I say primarily, because, and I'll explain that here in just a minute. When you see the title, the letter to the Hebrews, that was not in the original text. It was added later because the the general belief was because of the references to the Old Testament, because of the, the practices that it was written primarily to Hebrews because he doesn't really identify an audience. He doesn't identify Jews or Gentiles. All right. So within the, the letter itself, you're not going to find a specific group of people. All right. However, there are a lot of instances here where he talks about the Old Testament. And so people would have had to have known the Old Testament in order to understand it. And most likely, there was a group of people around Rome. Because in chapter 13, you see him mention Italy. So that's really all the information we have about who the recipients were. And I say primarily believers, because we know that even in a group of this size, Okay? Even in a group of this size, who are primarily all believers, there are going to be some people in here who are not believers. Okay? And so it was true back then as well. And the reason I say that is because when we go through this book, some of the difficult passages, we need to understand who was he directing these to. Because within the pocket of those Jewish believers, there were also some Jews who were close to salvation who were close to accepting Jesus, but didn't cross that line. And there are some who made professions of faith, but walked away. And the Scriptures would tell us that the reality is they were never saved to begin with. Okay, So when we get to those passages, we'll explain that as we go. So, so that's why I say primarily it's written to Jewish believers, but understand that there are going to be unbelievers that some of these texts are addressed to. Okay, So he appeals to the authority of the Old Testament. And his readers had to know it. So that's why we, we say that. So we're going to need to know our Old Testament. We're going to need to keep our Old Testament open as we go through this book. So what is the theme of Hebrews? The theme of Hebrews is that Jesus is the ultimate expression of of God's work amongst humanity. Do you remember this? Do you remember the Bible was written, and I've said this over and over and over again, the Bible was written by real people in real time to real people with real struggles. Okay? And we have to understand that this was a first century letter. And so what were the Scriptures that they had at the time? It was not the completed work of the New Testament. It was the Old Testament. So those people who want to throw the Old Testament out and say "Ah, it's not relevant, the writer of Hebrews would disagree with you. So we need to know our Old Testament. And he's going to use the Old Testament. And this this is one of the marvelous theological truths. Because a lot of people say you can only talk about Jesus when you get to the New Testament. No way. You have to know the Old Testament if you're really going to talk about Jesus in the New Testament. Because the writer of Hebrews builds a theology of of who Jesus is based on Old Testament passages. So he's going to appeal to them with a a communication that says Jesus 
Christ alone is the ultimate fulfillment of everything God promised in the Old Testament. Jesus is the better sacrifice. He's the better high priest. He's the better covenant. And we're going to talk more about that as we go throughout the book. But let me encourage you to do this. Whenever you see the word better, to mark that in your Bibles. To mark that highlight however you want to do it. Uh, because you're going to see Him use that term over and over and over again. And to create what I would call maybe a Jesus is better journal. So that when you're tempted to uh, stray away, when you're tempted to pursue things more than you pursue Christ, you pull out that journal and you, and you read everything that the book of Hebrews says about how Jesus is better. And you say, this is what I need to go after. Because you're going to find some great theological truths when you stop to consider that Jesus is better than everything. It's a great book to remind ourselves of the supremacy and finality of Christ. And it puts everything into its proper perspective. So what was the purpose? Why did he write this book? It's an exhortation for God's people to remain faithful to Him and His Word. That's the practical side of this book. It really functions more as a sermon than a letter. Okay, there, there are elements of, of a New Testament letter in here, but when you look at all of the things together, it really does function more as a sermon instead of a letter. In chapter 13, verse 22, he says, I urge you, brethren, bear with this word of exhortation, for I have written to you briefly. That word of exhortation means it was to be a, a source of encouragement, a comfort. But it also was intended to move them to move them beyond where they were to a greater level, to motivate them to action. See, they were, in, they were facing an intense persecution. And it was only going to get worse. If you know anything about history, you know about Nero. And you know about what he was doing to believers. And many of the people at that time were losing their lives, were, were losing their livelihoods. And they were, if I were to, term, to use a term that we use today, they were facing a real sense of a cancel culture. Okay? We hear of a cancel culture today. It's nothing like what they experienced. The cancel culture of their day. And see, in our present reality, uh, we really have no concept of what it was like for these first century Jewish believers. You see, Christianity was not an accepted religion amongst the Jews. And it was not an accepted religion amongst the pagans. And so you had persecution from outside. The government itself was persecuting the believers here. So you had an outside interference. Persecution. But we need to think too of who he's writing to, to Jews. Because you see, for them to forsake the Old Testament practices, to forsake all of that was to forsake their heritage to go against their family traditions. And to do that, they would be ostracized from their families. So they're not only uh, excommunicated from the society, they're excommunicated from their families. And so this was a real struggle for them. Because if they identified with Christ, it was going to bring down wrath from the government. It was going to bring down wrath from their families. And so the temptation was for them to forsake all of that. And to use what the writer would say, to shrink back. The small group of Jewish Christians who were scared stiff. They began to avoid contact with outsiders altogether to really just become the, that silent believer. No one needs to know. One of the most quoted passages of Hebrews is chapter 10, verse 25, which talks about don't forsake the assembling of yourselves together. Why? Because they were afraid to get together. They were afraid to minister to one another because if they got found out, they could be persecuted. And so he didn't want them to shrink away from that. He feared that if they were be arrested, they would forsake the name of Christ and just forget it altogether. So, all throughout this book, the writer is going to make an argument that, that Jesus is better than all of that. All of the other things you're placing your faith in, Jesus is better than all that. Don't shrink back. Don't abandon Christ. I think there are two verses that stand out 
as key verses. One of those is chapter 2, verse 1. It says, For this reason we must pay much closer attention to what we have heard so that we do not drift away from it. Do you think that verse speaks to our day? Just think about that for just a moment. When people hear what's going on in our culture, the pressures of our culture, believers drifting away from what they have heard, basing their theology of who Jesus is, basing their theology of who God is, on what the culture says about who Jesus is. And the writer of Hebrews would say, we can't do that. We have to pay careful attention to what we've heard so that we don't drift away. And brothers and sisters, I would say to you that the church of 2024 is in dire need of believers who are not drifting away. So regardless of what these other churches are going to focus on, we're going to focus on the Word of God that says, don't drift. Don't shy away. Stay faithful. Writers of Hebrews is, is really going to challenge with that. Another one is chapter 3, verse 12. He says, Take care, brethren, that there not be in any one of you an evil, unbelieving heart that falls away from the living God. See, there's a reference to the unbelievers amongst them. He's saying, I want you to know the truth about Jesus so that you walk away convinced of who Jesus is. And then that there not be anyone amongst you who has an unbelieving heart, and then you, you drift away. You fall away from the living God. And so, Hebrews is very rich theologically, but it's also very rich practically. Because he gives us, in his exhortation, he gives us some warnings. I'm going to put these up on the screen, and if you want these, if I go too fast, you know, I can always give you these if you want them. Here are the warnings that you're going to find throughout Hebrews. Don't drift from what you've heard. That's why it's so important for us to know theology. Right? I know sometimes people say, why do we focus so much on theology? Because if we didn't have theology, we wouldn't know how to live. Because there's a direct link between what we believe and what we practice, or there ought to be. So we can't drift from what we've heard. Don't disbelieve the voice of God. Don't, don't discount what He said. Don't degenerate from the elementary principles of Christ. Don't despise the knowledge of truth. Don't devalue the grace of God. Don't depart from He who speaks. These are all going to be exhortations that the writer of Hebrews is going to say to them, but it also speaks to us. Because these are things that our churches today struggle with. Wanting to depart from the Word of God. So here at Open Door, we focus on studying the Word. We focus on what God has said to us in His Word. It's not about our opinions. It's about what does God say. And we're going to stand on that. Why? Because God has spoken. And we need to listen. So as we embark upon this journey, it will be long, but our prayer is that through this highly theological and highly practical book, that it penetrates our hearts, much like the writer of Hebrews intended. And that we remain faithful to God as we consider the truth that Jesus is better than everything. Well, that's just kind of a bird's eye view of the book of Hebrews. So as we go into this next portion, we're just going to look at the first four verses. And this is packed with theology. It's packed with theology. And here's a synopsis of what we're going to look at here this morning. Jesus is better because God is fully and finally revealed in Him. Okay? Jesus is better because God is fully and finally revealed in Him. A lot of truth there. Let's look at chapter 1, verses 1 to 4. That says, God, after He spoke long ago to the fathers and the prophets in many portions and in many ways, in these last days has spoken to us in His Son, whom He appointed heir of all things, through whom also He made the world. And He is the radiance of His glory and the exact representation of His nature and uphold to all things by the word of His power. When He had made purification of sins, He sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high, having become as much better than the angels, as He has inherited a more excellent name than they. No usual greetings here like a New Testament writer would give you. All right? He wants to make his point quickly. 
And he wants to focus the attention on Christ, on Jesus, who Jesus is, the ultimate revelation of God. So what does the writer reveal about Jesus as God's Son that makes Him the final revelation and better than everything? That's the question we're going to try to answer here this morning. What does the writer reveal that we need to know that will solidify Jesus as being the final Word of God? Well, the first thing he says here is that He is the prophet through whom God has spoken. God, after He spoke long ago to the fathers and the prophets in many portions, and in many ways. We'll stop there. See, right off the bat, we gain some rich theological truth regarding the doctrine of Revelation. Not the book of Revelation, but the doctrine of Revelation. What is that? Well, we need to understand that God is the source. God is the source of Revelation. This is a theological assertion that we cannot ignore. God, after He spoke, Right? That in itself is a marvelous thing because we have a God who chooses to speak to us. You see, we would not know God unless God revealed Himself to us. And so God made sure that He revealed Himself in very specific ways. He's the source We would never know the meaning of the cross if it wasn't for God explaining it to us. See, Revelation is God revealing Himself to make known to us that which we would not know on our own. That's Revelation. And so as you go through the Scriptures, you're going to see that the Bible is going to speak to us through two types of Revelation. Okay, God Himself speaks through specific. All right, He's going to use specific types of revelation. And so here, here's what we see. Okay, two types. There's general revelation. Okay, we read this in, in Psalm 19. The heavens are telling of the glory of God, and their expanse is declaring the work of His hands. Day to day pours forth speech, and night to night reveals knowledge. And then in Romans chapter one and verse twenty. We read, for since the creation of the world, His invisible attributes, His eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood through what has been made so that they are without excuse. What that's telling us is that there is enough evidence out there through general revelation that everyone knows, whether they want to acknowledge it or not, everyone knows that there is someone higher than they. That's general revelation. Romans goes on to say that they suppress that truth, right? But there's enough information to at least let you know that there is a higher being. But general revelation is not sufficient enough to give us a full understanding of who God is, a full understanding of Christ. And so that's why we have special revelation or specific revelation. That's the direct verbal words that come from the mouth of God. The direct speaking, like the words that are coming out of my mouth, okay? God speaks. That's direct, special revelation. And so the scripture is one of those. 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 21 says, For no prophecy was ever made by an act of human will, but men moved by the Holy Spirit spoke from God. 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16 and 17. All Scripture is inspired by God. That means breathed out and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness so that the man of God may be adequate, equipped for every good work. So what you have here is the very words of God to us. The very specific words that God wanted us to have. So we have The Word of God. We're going to say a little bit more about this in in just a few moments. But Hebrews tells us that Jesus is the other way. So we have the Scripture and we have Jesus. Those are the two very specific ways that God chose to reveal Himself to us. And so He points to the Old Testament. He says, long ago, to the fathers, through the prophets. So we can't ignore the Old Testament. The prophets were the spokesmen and the writers, and they would communicate God's word in both verbal 
and also in print. So God is the source of revelation. We also see this that the writer reveals. That God's revelation of Himself was progressive. Okay? He says many portions, many ways. That is God being progressive. God did not back the dump truck of truth up and just unload it. Okay? All throughout time. He used a variety of modes. He used a variety of methods to communicate truth. It was always adequate for the time that they needed. It always revealed more of God and His ways. And it was always in continuity with the previous words. In other words, God is not going to say something later that contradicts what He said earlier. There's a continuity of what God says. So very clearly, the writer of Hebrews affirms the authority and authenticity of the Old Testament. So we would do well to know it. But God's story wasn't complete. It needed a conclusion. And it needed a messianic conclusion. Yes, the Old Testament is God's Word, but it wasn't the final Word. And that's where he brings in Jesus as the singular and final revelation of God. In these last days, God has spoken to us in His Son. He's clearly creating a a contrast between the multiplicity and diversity of the way God spoke. I mean, just think about all those different ways in the Old Testament that God spoke. He spoke through a burning bush. He, He wrote down His words on stone tablets. And He even spoke through a donkey. Please don't make any references here. Okay. God chose to use various ways to speak. But then when it came to Jesus, He is the final word. He is the final revelation. He's also contrasting t- different periods of time here. What took place long ago, and now what has taken place in Christ Jesus. The last days is the word eschatos, which we get... Uh, eschatology from the doctrine of last thinking uh, of last things in Jewish in the Jewish mindset. I know some people may not agree with this, but in the Jewish mindset, mindset God's working was dispensational. Okay, what do I mean by that? God's work with Israel was age specific, meaning that God worked with Israel during the period of the patriarchs, and he he worked differently in the age of Moses, and he worked differently in the age of the prophets. His message was the same, but the way God worked was different. Okay, And so in their mindset, the age of the patriarchs was followed by the age of Moses, was followed by the age of, of the kings and the judges. I mean, you can see all those different periods of history. Those were all different periods in which God was revealing Himself. But also there was an age which they were looking forward to, and that was the age of the Messiah. However long that may be, And the Scriptures indicate that in their mindset, it was going to culminate in the eternal state when God permanently dwells with His people. You can see that in Isaiah. You can see that in Daniel. To the New Testament writers, they were in the last days. So what does that mean? In their mindset, the last days began when Jesus entered the scene. Through His life, His death, His resurrection and His exaltation. That began the last days. That shifted from the Old Testament economy to now a new way that God was working. And that is through Christ. So to them, the last days were a present reality. And just as much as it was a present reality to them, it is still a present reality to us. We are still in those last days. Because God has not changed His way of working. God has not changed His Word. He's not trying to strike a debate as to when the Messiah was coming, but to recognize He's already come and that Jesus is the Messiah. And so what we have here is that Jesus ushered in the final source of God speaking to us. So we would do well to listen to Him. And this is very important for us today. To make sure that our theology of Jesus is gathered from what the Bible reveals about Him. Not our culture. There are spiritual leaders who claim to have a word from Christ or a word from God. 
And then that word contradicts what God has already said. And notice God didn't say He speaks through dreams and visions and audible voices or a language that no one can understand. I know that's hard for some people to hear through that ecstatic speech or whatever you want to claim. You'll never hear me say, I have a message from Christ. Why? Because this is the very message of Christ. And anyone you hear who says that, the flag better go up. Because what follows next, it better fit this. Because if it doesn't, you ought to reject what they say. It has to fit. Jesus fulfills everything God pointed to in the Old Testament. Everything. He's no longer speaking through the prophets. The final Word of God. It's all complete. And we have a privilege that the New Testament readers did not. We have the completed Word of God. So we have the full picture. Everything we have here for life and godliness, God has given to us. So we would do well to know it. So the rest of the text here is the writer beautifully portrays who Jesus is. And he lays out his argument as to why we should listen to Jesus. Why should we follow Christ? Why do we need to believe what he says? So we're going to go through these. And we're just going to look at a phrase at a time as we go through these. The first one is he's the heir of all things. He says, he, whom he appointed, whom God appointed as heir of all things, the Jews would have known exactly what he was talking about here. To be an heir was to be invested in everything. The son was given full authority. To do business with the son is to do business with the father. Just like if you needed some pipes from the Montgomery's, you could talk to one of the Montgomery boys and you're just like you're talking to Pastor Matthew. That's exactly what he's talking about here. To work with the son is to work with the father. To be an heir was to be invested in everything. To have full authority. John 14, verses 6 and 7 says, Jesus said, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father but through Me. Regardless of what the culture says, there is only one way to God, and that is through Jesus Christ alone. So what are you doing with Jesus? He's the heir of all things. And here's, here's great New Testament truth because He's an heir of all things. Guess what? In Christ, we've inherited all things. What a, what a treasure. Why? Because He has inherited it all. It also says here that He is the Creator who made the universe. Through whom also He made the world. Similar to what John said in John chapter 1. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things came into being through Him, and apart from Him, nothing came into being that has come into being. See, there's a faith out there that tries to tell you Jesus was a created being. And this speaks directly to that and says, don't buy that. Jesus was the Creator of all things. He's the Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end. He is the agent of creation. And it's great here that the writer of Hebrews ties redemption to creation. God is the one who creates. God is the one who redeems. And if we miss the doctrine of creation, we miss the rest of Scripture. If you want to throw out Genesis 1 through 11, you might as well throw out the rest of Scripture. Why do I say that? Because we did not create ourselves. I know that kind of blows our mind, right? We did not create ourselves. We are responsible to our Creator. And we sin miserably against our Creator. And because we sin miserably, we have no means within ourselves to reconcile ourselves to Him. We need help. So God reached down in history to provide the reconciliation we needed and He provided redemption. And that redemption required that God become one of us. That God become one of us so that He could die for us, so that He could redeem us. And there's only one person who's ever walked the face of this earth that can fulfill that. And that is Jesus Christ alone. The one who created us. 
is the one who gave himself for us and the one who recreates us. Jesus is the creator. He is also the representation of God's being. Verse 3 says, and he is the radiance of his glory and the exact representation of his nature. That radiance goes back to the notion of the Shekinah glory in the Old Testament. If you remember that, when Moses came down from the mountain, his face was glowing. But that's kind of the idea of the Shekinah. It was the shining, visible glory that demonstrated the majesty of God. You can see that in Exodus 13. You can see it in Exodus 40. The Shekinah was that visible glory. That visible glory of God. To see Jesus is to see the very glory of God. But more than that, it says that Jesus is the exact representation of the Father. The root word there is that of a stamp, like a coin. Jesus would use this word when He said, render unto Caesars what is Caesars. How did you know what was Caesars? You looked at the coin and you saw the image of on that coin. The stamp. So when you see Jesus, you see God. Why? Because He is the exact representation of God. He is the second member of the Trinity. And this is a truth that just blows my mind. That Jesus is fully God and fully man. Poof! My mind is blown. Two natures into one. No one can claim that but Jesus. At no point did Jesus ever surrender His deity. He has always been God. Jesus and God are the same in essence. He has a different role in the Godhead, but He is still God. And He is still man. I just cannot fully grasp that. That's one of those tensions in Scripture that we accept by faith. So the writer of Hebrews pushes us that to understand Jesus rightly is to see Him as the climax of God. He is the ultimate revelation of who God is. He is God Himself. And then he goes on in verse 3, and he says, and upholds all things by the word of His power. Not only did Jesus create the world, but He sustains it also. This is a present active participle, meaning He hasn't stopped. Think about this. When Jesus was hanging on the cross for your sin and for my sin, not only was He bearing the weight of the sin upon us, but this verse here tells us that at the same time, He is sustaining the world. Because He has the very power within His words to say, I've had enough. And the world would be gone just like that. Because that's how powerful Jesus is. And so he could have hung on that cross and he could have looked down at these people and the pain in which he was suffering for us. He could have looked down and said, you know what? I'm done with these people. Why do I need to do this? Why? Because it was all part of God's plan. And the world is not going to end the way the people think it's going to end. They think that we're contributing to the world's going to end tomorrow, guess what? The Bible's already revealed how the world's going to end. God said it, and that settles it. And no way is Jesus going to destroy the world like that until God's plan is done. But we need to understand that He's sustaining the world. He sustains you and me in the most difficult points of our lives. He's sustaining us. What a glorious Savior. He's also the priest who provided purification for sin. When he had made purifications of sin, we'll focus on that. We'll deal more with this as we get to, to chapters 9 and 10, but it, that purification encapsulates all that, that Christ did. It recalls that sacrificial Old Testament system. Jesus Himself accomplished what the Old Testament sacrifices could not. The Old Testament sacrifices could could only cover sin. Jesus' sacrifice would completely purify from sin. One sacrifice that dealt with them all. 
So he introduces that concept, and he's going to talk more about it as he goes on. But Jesus is the ultimate high priest. One of the reasons why is because he never had to make a sacrifice for himself like the other priests did. Jesus himself entered the Holy of Holies. We'll talk more about that, but, but Jesus is the, the marvelous um, purifier of our sin. He is the king who sat down at his place of honor. He sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. To be at someone's right hand is to be in the place of favor, place of authority. And so Jesus holds that place of majesty above all powers, above all things. Because He's at God's right hand, He is able to make intercession for us. Think about that. The One who created you is also the One who intercedes for you. Romans chapter 8, verse 34. Who is the One who condemns? Christ Jesus is He who died. Yes, rather, who was raised, who is at the right hand of God, who also intercedes for us. You have a Savior who is daily sustaining you and daily interceding for you. And, and here's something I think about. You know, sometimes we, we say, God, are you hearing my prayers? Every time Jesus prays, God hears. Every intercession he makes, God hears it. So when we think that God's not hearing us, He is hearing His Son. The Scriptures tell us that when we regard iniquity in our heart, God doesn't hear us. So that, that's a whole other sermon topic in itself. But to think that, that the Creator of the universe is pleading, interceding for us. Wow. He's a king in the right place. He's better than angels. Verse 4, having become as much better than angels. Angels had a prominent place in the history of Israel. In the Jewish mind, they were higher than man. They were the next step to God. And in their thinking, historically, that there was a, there was a sect within Judaism at this time that, that taught that, that Michael was the archangel and he was even greater than the Messiah. And, and so the writer is, is writing to correct that. And the verb having become... This is a change of state, not a change of existence. What do I mean by that? There are some out there that want to tell you that Jesus became the Son of God. And I want to tell you, and this is another one of those truths that just blows my mind, Jesus has always been the eternal Son of God. There never was a point where He became the Son of God. He has always existed as God. Meaning, He has always had the second place in the Trinity. Not second place as far as less than, but second member. And again, that's one of those truths that just blows our mind. I can't fully explain it. But by having inherited what he's saying there is that his, his name is higher than any name possible. His name is Lord, the sovereign Son of God. No angel no human being can ever claim that name of God. Jesus is the final word. He's been appointed because of his position in the Godhead. He's been appointed the sovereign Lord of all. So he's inherited a better name, but if you want to know more about that, you have to come back next week. So a lesson for life here this morning. Let us truly treasure Jesus, our Creator, Redeemer, and Sustainer. There's a treasure trove of theology in these first four verses. But even more rich than, than the theology that, that we gain there about revelation and creation and all those things are, are these things. I, I put, I'll leave this up there. Just in these four verses alone, this is what we learn about who Jesus is. The revelation of God, ultimate fulfillment, the heir, the creator, the reading. Wow. That's the one who died for you. It's the one who died for me. But he didn't stay dead. He rose again to give us new life. And so, 
Hebrews is not for the theologically faint of heart. Because we have a remarkable portrait of Christ. And so I ask you this, what more do we need to hear before we become more faithful to Him? Let's ask for God's help to motivate us in our love for Him and to motivate us to be more faithful. Let's pray. Lord, thank You for Your Word. And Lord, what, what rich truths we find here in this text. And, and Lord, I pray that, that these truths will penetrate our hearts and will motivate us to greater levels of faithfulness as we uh, see Jesus for who He is. May we lay aside all those things that entangle us and may we run with endurance the race You set before us. May we look to the author and finisher of our faith where we find all things better in Him. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.